I believe we as humans have um, an innate feeling to want to be heard, to be seen, and to be understood. I also believe that we have a gift to make each other feel heard, seen, and understood. And a lot of folks don't know how to lean into it. But I believe that I am divinely gifted to lean into that genius, to lean into that gifting. And I want to leverage that gift of making people feel seen, heard, understood, valued, to amplify and uplift black voices in my city and in around the nation. I'm Orlando Bailey. Welcome to my class. What I wish people understood about storytelling, narrative shifting and building, is that the record will outlive you. The record will outlive your children. And it is so important to document the observation. It's really that simple. Document the observation. You do it every day in your brain, put it on paper, <laughs> write it down. I remember uh, growing up, my grandmother would sit on the porch and she would watch people come and go up and down the street and then talk about what happened on the block that day. <laughs> she, she would talk about what she observed, right? We observe so much. We see so much. There is power in documenting it. Because if you are like me, however many generations down, you will have this insatiable curiosity about where you come from, who your family was, what the legacy of your black is, and if I can type in a Google search <laughs> and see a voice that reminds me of me, see a name of a family member or a relative on the record, it adds to the richness and the pride I feel about myself, because that's important, but also my community. Why does this work matter? Because you matter. Your community matters, your family matters, okay? And so your experiences, the culture of your city, the culture that you are a part of, your family, your lineage, your expertise, your viewpoint should be documented. Why? Because you matter. There are modern day griots everywhere. What is a griot? Well, in West African tradition, it is the passer down of stories, the storyteller, the, the culture keeper, the passer down of customs, your school teacher, your journalist, your neighborhood historian, that cousin that always has the camera in your face at every family gathering, <laughs> your professors, your community development organizations, griots are everywhere. And their work is urgent to document the observation. This session is for the cultural placekeeper. 
It is for the family documenter. It's for the storytellers. It's for the journalists. It's for city builders and urbanists who work on behalf of and with communities, especially communities that are disenfranchised and communities of color. This class is for all of you because all of you have the power to document the observation, to put pen to paper on what you see, the culture that you observe, the culture that you are a part of. This is for you. Here's what you'll get out of this session. You will develop the skill of listening. You will understand why equitable sourcing is of the utmost importance. You will learn how to conduct interviews and you're gonna leave knowing how to surface and tell these stories. Whether you are a podcaster, whether you plan on participating in a drum circle, or whether you're gonna stand on the stage and just tell the story, we're gonna teach you how to do that. My parents met as young adults in the 1980s. They met on the street called Manistique because they both lived on that street. That's right. Their parents lived on the same street and they got together into that union were five children. Me being the middle child. <laughs> can you imagine? Can you imagine growing up on a block with so much community, so much family, so much love. I mean, my siblings and I were frolic through the tall grown-ups playing tag and hide and go seek. We would go from grandma's house to grandma's house. Even though granddaddy was there, it was still grandma's house, okay? But I remember being fascinated with my maternal grandmother. She is this tall, chocolate, regal woman. And back then, she had this carefully manicured natural with a soft yet commanding presence. I remember every day, my grandmother would sit at her dining room table and she would read her newspaper with her reading glasses on. And then after she'd taken the news of the day, she'd fold it back up, leave it on the table, and then I'd see her pontificate with our neighbors, our family members, and cousins and aunties and sisters about the news of the day. What was going on in Mary Young's office or at the city council table or in, in Bill Clinton's White House? I thought the newspaper made my grandmother smart. So I wanted to be just as smart as my grandmother. I always had this fascinating relationship with the newspaper. As a toddler, my mother would lay newspaper down on the floor at my grandmother's house, and she would sit me down in the newspaper, and she would bring out a bowl of mashed potatoes, and I would devour these mashed potatoes. Listen, you put any kind of potato in front of me today, I'm still going to devour that potato. I still love potatoes to this day, right? But I make a mess in the newspaper. So much so that my uncle prophetically nicknamed me newspaper. So after grandma was done reading her newspaper, I drive over to the dining room table in my little tykes car. I get out of my little tice car and I slam the door like I was really getting out of a real car. I climb up in her chair at the dining room table, put on her reading glasses just like she did, open the paper and begin to look at the paper. I thought the reading glasses were magic so that I would be able to understand everything that was going on in the news of the day. <laughs> the thing was I couldn't read. <laughs> 
I couldn't read a thing. I didn't know what that newspaper was talking about. But my imagination, it told me that I could. And by the time I was in the sixth grade, I had purchased my first newspaper subscription. And that was to the Detroit Free Press. And it came every single day before school. And so I would be on the school bus on my way to junior high. I'm in the sixth grade <laughs> reading the newspaper. <laughs> I was enamored. I was enamored by the stories. I was enamored and fascinated by the record. I went on to the Detroit High School for the Fine and Performing Arts, founded by none other than Dr. Denise Davis Cotton in the early 1990s. And I got the opportunity to study with Detroit greats like Phil Simpson, Shifi McFly, and Tony Hooligan, among others. It's the, you know, it's known as the school Aaliyah went to. Yeah, that's the school I went to. I went to the school that Aaliyah went to and I studied speech and theater. And believe it or not, I had a speech impediment that I needed therapy uh, to correct. I had a severe lisp. And my theater teacher was like, oh, you gonna perform and you gonna get these words out. Your diction is gonna be perfect. And so she hammered me. I'm so grateful uh, for her teaching and for her consistency with me. But while at DSA, my senior year, we started a broadcast team. And it was my first taste of writing and delivering news every single day for the student body and staff. I went on to Eastern Michigan University to study broadcasting and journalism. And there I produced and anchored the campus news weekly show. That's right. Every week you would see me on television in Ypsilanti and everywhere around campus sitting behind the anchor desk, anchoring the news around Eastern Michigan University and the surrounding neighborhoods. And when I came home from college, I got a job working for a community development organization on the southeast side of Detroit, Warren County Development Coalition, now known as Eastside Community Network. And there, I was able to hone my skill of listening. Because when I went back home and I began to work in neighborhoods, I knew, number one, that I was not the expert. And I knew, number two, that I had to listen. Because these were the same people that helped raise me. These were the same people that knew my grandmother. These were the same people that has known me since I was a little boy all the way now to a semi-grown man. And these folks, these neighborhood folks, I'm talking about people all over the southeast side, near the river, all the way up to the freeway, and everywhere in between, were so patient with me during this journey, right? And they would say things like, Orlando, we know you're learning, but make it snappy because it's urgent. It is urgent. At the time, folks on the southeast side were experiencing swaths and swaths of open space, demolitions, disinvestment. At the time, the East Side had the largest aggregate of vacant land in the city, right? These were people that were fighting to keep their neighborhoods alive, that were fighting so that they can be able to thrive and their families could be able to thrive. What did I know? fresh out of college, not a whole lot. But I knew that I can hone the skill I learned in journalism, and that is to listen and to ask questions that I could be successful as a community organizer, an economic developer, and a fundraiser. All of those titles I held <laughs> at Eastside Community Network. I spent almost a decade at that community development organization and it wasn't until 2020, on the brink of the pandemic, where I decided to make a switch to journalism. So I went to work for BridgeDetroit.com, an engagement in journalism organization that seeks to tell stories around issues that Detroiters themselves identify and prioritize. It's not a newsroom 
where we decide what's news and deliver it to our readership. We are constantly having iterative conversations with community all across the city about what matters to them. And we leverage our journalistic prowess to provide answers, to ask questions, to question power, especially, right? And solutions to some of the priorities that they have outlined in their engagement with us. In 2019, alongside my then CEO, Donna Givens Davidson, we started Authentically Detroit. Authentically Detroit is a podcast. We didn't know what we were doing in 2019, but we knew that we wanted to daylight some of the real candid and honest conversations that we would have every day in the office to a wider audience, and we kept doing it. A few years later, Authentically Detroit is a mainstay when we talk about the discourse happening in and about the city of Detroit. I'm super proud of that. And on that platform, we hear from residents, we hear from practitioners, we hear and we question government officials, we hear and we question corporate power and philanthropy. It is a space of radical candor and truth. I'm so proud of that. In 2018, I came on as host of the Urban Consulate in the Detroit chapter, where we convene people to have critical conversations about cities. The mission of Urban Consulate is to bring people together to share ideas about how to build more just and equitable cities. And so it is, it is that frame, it is that lens where we apply, we apply it to every single conversation that we have. It can be about parking, it can be about racial equity, it can be about journalism, it can be about storytelling, it can be about equitable development. We are still holding this tension of how we build more just and equitable cities. And on that platform, I've had the privilege not only to give it away to black folks, especially black women, but to daylight the magnificent work and wonderful stories of all kinds of practitioners, some of whom never had a public speaking gig before they sat down with me, but are now pros at telling their stories. As a part of my role with Bridge Detroit, I am also a regular contributor to the show American Black Journal on Detroit Public Television. It's our local PBS affiliate. And it is on that platform where I also get to have conversations about how to move the city of Detroit forward. In 2021, we took home the Emmy for Best Interview. Yes, that's right. While I was at Eastern Michigan University, my consciousness about Detroit began to shift because I would often hear folks who didn't look like me who wasn't from my city, talk about Detroit in a way that I just didn't appreciate it. Yeah, I'm talking about white folks talking about, oh, I, I, I have to be really, really careful when I come to the city. And my, you know, my parents really only let me come to the city for sporting events or for concerts. And then, you know, I'm right back, you know, in Oakland County or Macomb County. And I wanted to say, if the city is so bad, don't come. Like, legit, don't come. So my consciousness began to shift, right? Because it's okay if, like, my own community, well, it really wasn't, but my own community would say things like, yo, you know, get a degree, get out of here, go explore life. There's nothing here. There's so much heat here in the city of Detroit. And so when I heard other folks not from here talk about the city in that way, my consciousness began to shift, and I be became, you know, quite bullish, um, about, about Detroit, but unlearning, unlearning the narrative of having to escape this beautiful black space, right, to be successful was a challenge because that's what I heard all of my life. And so it was a divine calling when I graduated college for me to come back to the city. I knew I had to be here. And I knew that that narrative 
was on the flip side. I need Detroit to be a success. I began to notice this shift in narrative on part of papers, on part of publications that are meant to inform us and democratize information about the city of Detroit. What I noticed was that there is a narrative of revitalization. There is a narrative of comeback. There is this narrative of come to Detroit, invest in Detroit. There's so much land, there's so much open space. It's a blank slate, you can come here and do whatever. And that narrative was personified with a white millennial face. Detroit was over 80% black at the time. People that I was working with every single day, the elders of our communities, the young people of our communities who have been doing the work of revitalization all throughout the bankruptcy, all throughout the Great Recession. When the city couldn't provide services, the Lesters over in Jefferson Chalmers did. When the city couldn't cut the grass, those block clubs mowed those lots. When houses were open and vacant, the Neighborhood Association made sure that it was boarded up. And that was the piece that was missing. That was the piece that was trying to be erased. And I knew, I knew that it was my job to surface that counter narrative. If you come from a family like mine, you got plenty of practice, not only hearing stories, but telling stories. What happens when a bunch of black people get together around the table for a card game and a little bit of whiskey? <laughs> Is uh, the best comedy you will ever experience in your life in the form of storytelling. The reason I know what my uncle used to call me as a toddler is because we sat around the table one day having the time of our lives and he told me that story. The reason I know about my love for mashed potatoes, even as a toddler, is because we sat around and my mother told me that story. There are stories being told all the time in less formal spaces, right? At home, on the porch, right? Walk down the street. Uh, the elder down the street got stories for days. I remember, oh, I'll tell you this story. I remember uh, visiting my aunt all of the time. And there was this elder. Her name was Miss Emma. Miss Emma lived down the street. And her and my aunt were really good friends. Every time I went to my aunt's house, I would spend the day on the porch with Miss Emma, hearing about her travels abroad, her occupation, her sister, her never having children and why. Right, Miss Emma was a boss. She lived to be 102 years old. I'm so glad. I'm so glad I got her story, right? So be present in these spaces when these stories are going forth. Sometimes they're drunken stories. They're comedic stories, but they're stories nonetheless. <laughs> Embrace it. Document the observation. Jason Reynolds says, it is the writing down of a thing that is crystallized and then proliferated around the world. All right, so you got the story. You've written down your story. You've documented what you've observed. Now, how do you express that story? I'm happy to say to you that there are many different avenues by which you can do that. Submit a written piece into your local paper. They love receiving op-eds because that means that the journalists can work on something else and then they'll have content for their next issue to go out, right? Start a podcast like I did in 2019. It's so easy. Get a microphone. Your cell phone can act as your microphone. Go into the closet, shut the door, put a piece of blanket over your head and just start recording. Start the story. Bring grandma into that closet, record her telling her story. Just start, right? And not, don't just start it, right? Not only start. I want you to start, I want you to finish, and I want you to publish it. Somebody wants to hear what you 
have to offer, right? Television is also a medium by which you can express your story. Television, video, whatever it is. There are so many people who have gotten uh, worldwide acclaim because they took the leap to show up on video and to express that vulnerability, express that story. I'm thinking about, I don't know, Tabitha Brown on Instagram, right? I love Auntie Tab, even though she's like six years older than me. She's Auntie all day, right? But she took the first step and turning on that video camera, no matter how poor or high quality that cell phone camera was at the time, and told the world her story. The rest is history. Let me say this. Expressing your story can be daunting. Expressing your story can be scary. You have the ability, no matter how young or old, to tell your story. You have the ability, especially the elder, especially you. I'm talking to you, auntie. I'm talking to you, uncle. You have the ability to overcome some of the apprehension that you may feel because sometimes the story is traumatizing. I get it. You don't want to release that. But for your legacy to live on beyond you, so that your family, your community, can be rich in the stock of where they come from. Go on and release that story. You can do it. Remember when you're telling your story, you're also involuntarily or voluntarily telling uh, the story of so many people who have been a part of your life. So make sure you are going in holding that tension with as much respect as you can. You may be up next at the Moth Story Slam or at the Secret Society of Twisted Storytellers where you're gonna tell a story. Prepare, get the story in you, and when you step on that stage, command that audience. Take control of the mic. Nobody can tell your story better than you. So go in with that confidence. And confidence and fear can exist at the same time. But let confidence be the overwhelming emotion that you employ when you are telling your story and the stories of your community. You can do it. I believe in you. Seven billion people in the world. Everybody is looking to be heard, to be seen, and to be understood. There is power in being in community, in conversation, in the moment with somebody where you see them, hear them, and understand them. And let's say you hold a position of power in a city. Let's say you sit in a seat of philanthropy where you hold a large purse that shepherds capital into disenfranchised and marginalized areas. We don't want you to tokenize a community that you're working on behalf of. We want you to be in community with the community that you serve. I operate and this amazing duality whereby I am a journalist and I tell stories about the city, what's happening in the city, the good things that's happening in the city, the bad things that are happening to people. I also inhabit and live in that city. And so I am also experiencing as a resident the good things that happen, the bad things that happen to me, in everything in between. I am in community with the community that we write with and for. Be in community. Lean into it. 
It's not always comfortable, but it's worth it. If the community is skeptical in talking to uh, you, if you are in media or if you are in philanthropy or if you are a politician or some kind of figure with privilege and power, they are rightfully skeptical uh, because all too often, especially in media, media has had a transactional relationship with marginalized communities, right? We have an angle that we want to pursue. We will find a source that fits within that angle, sometimes without respect for the dignity of the community, the dignity of the interview subject. So what I am saying to you is when you are pursuing community, when you are pursuing conversations and relationship and interviews with subjects in and around cities, move at the speed of trust. Even if you aren't the person or entity that has caused that community harm. As a person who is looking to tell stories, we have to answer for that. When I was working in community development, I had the opportunity to partner with the municipality on many planning projects in and throughout the east side of Detroit. And one of the things that we made sure that we did as a community engagement team was interview the residents in the impacted area where the planning was going. This took a tremendous amount of time. I want to emphasize to you that community engagement is slow. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> community engagement is slow, but it is worth it. Oftentimes, when we are coming into the communities to plan, to erect new and exciting things, there is a cultural anxiety that exists whereby people feel like their contribution, their neighborhood, their culture that they created in this physical space can be erased. And what we wanted to do was not erase, but add value to that physical space while honoring the stories of community. And so we sat and we listened for hours. We stood on the porches of residents who had convened their neighbors just to reminisce and talk about what used to be and what they wanted to be and took notes. So when the end product came, it held up it propped up the richness that already exists in so many communities. Systems and policies have habitually disadvantageously affected black folks in this country. And so when someone from an institution that could be a philanthropic organization or from city government decides that they want to come and be in conversation with community and engage community, Oftentimes, these communities are traumatized, right? And that trauma shows up in many different ways, especially in conflict. Don't be mad about the trauma. Don't be mad if trauma shows up. Lean into it. Because more often than not, the institution that you work for, the sector that you are in, is culpable and the trauma that has been inflicted in these communities, even if you weren't there at the time. So we gotta answer for that. We have to make space for that. We don't want to make space around that. No, let's hear it, let's confront it, and let's deal with it. They'll respect you more. I want to talk to you about conducting the interview. This is so important to get any bodies, any communities story, right? Conducting the interview is an elementary and integral part of making sure that we have the whole and accurate story about anything, 
right? This is what we talk about when we talk about sourcing. An interview is nothing more than you sourcing a story. So first, when you are getting ready to conduct an interview, do your research <laughs> as much as you can. If you are going to interview a particular person, right, a change maker, a practitioner, Google them, read articles that they were quoting in. If they have talks and things that they've given online, listen to them, digest them. If they have works that they've already written, read those books, read those white papers. Do a tremendous amount of research. Over-prepare, over-prepare. Because what happens when you get to the interview, even things that you didn't think will come up will come to your memory as your interview subject is talking and you will be able to level with and bring up something from their past, something interesting that can tie into the conversation that you will currently be having. One of the other things about conducting the interview is you wanna make sure that you got people's names right. <laughs> if they have a name that you aren't sure to pronounce, make sure you ask them politely how to pronounce their name and write it down phonetically if you need to so that you don't disrespect them by calling them a name that their mother or father did not give them. Do your research before the interview and when you are in the presence of your interviewee, before the interview starts, before you go on the record, here's what you have to do, right? You have to set intentions. You need to let the interviewee know what you want out of the interview. Be honest, be candid, right? But also open up the space for the interviewee to tell you what they want from the interview. That way, the two of you can come to an agreement and in the process of the interview, get what both of you want and need, right? It is so important to me that I sit and talk with and set intentions with every interview subject that I have because it breaks the barrier of being a stranger, interviewing another stranger. You sort of get to know that person. And folks always appreciate knowing what you want out of it. And they always appreciate the opportunity to state what they want out of it. It lowers uh, the barrier of connection and it builds relationship. Often that kind of conversation morphs into many other conversations where you would be begging that person to say, hey, wait, wait, save it for the record. <laughs> when you are conducting an interview and you have a limited amount of time to conduct the interview, make sure you tell your interview subject ahead of time how much time you have, right? And when it comes time to end said interview, right? Give them a five minute warning. Hey, we got about five minutes left. Let me ask you this. So they're not caught off guard when you have to end the interview because of time. It happens all the time. Give people notice, they'll respect it. Okay, so if you're gonna do this work, I am going to admonish you to do something that don't come naturally to a lot of us. <laughs> and that is, Listen, <laughs> actively listen. Let me tell you why actively listening is so important. You have to be able to master the follow-up question. And your follow-up question will either be like so on point or completely off based upon what the interview subject is talking about. Let me give you an example. I can be interviewing, you can be interviewing someone who's about, I don't know, the basketball game last week. And they say something along the lines of, yeah, I was at the basketball game and it was great. And it was great to see everybody. You know, I remember back when I was Michael Jordan's secretary and I used to go to the basketball games and it was great. Instead of, ask, instead of your next question being, so what was your favorite moment about uh, the basketball game? Your follow-up question should be, hold up, you were Michael Jordan's secretary? 
Tell me about that experience, right? So oftentimes we tend to have a list of questions that we may want to ask, and it is tempting because it's rehearsed and it's practice to want to stick to those questions. Those questions are just a rubric. You've done the prep work, you've done the research, when you get to your interview subject, when you're sitting across from somebody, when you are standing next to somebody, forget those questions. Be in the moment, actively listen and engage. It makes for a better experience for them, a better experience for whomever will be listening or watching, and you'll be proud of it in the end because you won't let any amazing fact go uncovered. You just interview Michael Jordan's former secretary and he didn't even know it. <laughs> Actively listening is especially important when you occupy positions of power. You can be a mayor, you can be a political figure like a city council person, or you can be the head of your local nonprofit community development organization. What you need to know and understand is that all expertise is valuable, not just yours, but especially the expertise of the citizenry, the expertise of the resident. And so one has to learn to actively listen to the expertise of residents, to the expertise and experience of the people that you say you serve. How can you equitably and uh, uh, accurately serve people that you don't listen to? Have enough respect for the people that you say you serve to listen to them and their stories. They'll help you do your job a lot better. Ask the question and be quiet. Listen, once again, listen for a tense moment, a problem that they may have identified, a really, really cool story that they want to gloss over so that you can actively follow up. You want to make sure that you follow up. Again, you have overprepared. You know what questions you want to ask. You know all about this person. You know all about this community. Now it is time for you to be in the moment with that person. If you bring questions to your interview, like I do sometimes, right? If you ask a person a question and they begin to add, answer that question and be in conversation with you and you're looking down to figure out what your next question is gonna be, it's gonna break the flow of the interview. It's gonna break the trust that you have tried to build with that interview subject. Be in the moment. You got it. It's all in your preparation. Let me tell you another thing about conducting an interview. Sometimes your interview may take an emotional turn and that's okay. Be in the moment with your interviewee. Sometimes we are tempted to kill the emotion by talking over the interview subject if they become emotional. Let it breathe. Be there with them. You being there is enough. I remember I was conducting an interview with a colleague turned friend of mine who was talking about her love for Detroit. And she got emotional. And it was almost gonna make me emotional, but I, I held it together. She got emotional. And I didn't interrupt her. I didn't break the silence. I looked her in the eye and I assured her that I was with her. Those moments are paramount in helping to convey the story. Those moments humanize the subject matter and the interviewee. Lean into it. Be in the moment. It'll be okay. Sometimes conducting an interview, especially with a black elder, can be difficult because we may be asking an elder to go back to a time that their blood remembers 
it not being a good time. Their body goes to a place where they didn't feel safe. They didn't feel seen, valued, or heard. Sometimes those kind of stories are hard to tell. They're worth telling, but they are hard to tell. Be patient. I just learned not too long ago from my 83-year-old grandmother that at one point she was working in one of the richest suburbs in the nation that's directly adjacent to the city of Detroit. And when she would be on her way home, white folks would chase her to the Detroit city line. They didn't want her on their blocks. They didn't want her in their neighborhoods. And this is a story that she never told. I get why she never told it. That's hard to go back to. That's hard to remember. But I gave her the space and she got there on her own. Give folks the space and the time to tell their stories, especially when so many of our stories are written with habitual trauma. All stories have a climactic point. All stories have a problem that is trying to be solved. All stories have a conflict. And all too often, we do not like conflict. We stray away from it. We don't want confrontation. Let me say this, conflict does not mean confrontation. It just means conflict. <laughs> and let me say this, confrontation doesn't mean violence either, right? So oftentimes, especially if you are a journalist interviewing folks in power, like a politician or someone at the top of the corporate ladder, right? There, there may be a story that they're trying to tell and there may be questions that you need to ask that they don't want to ask, which can present sometimes uh, a little bit of conflict and a little bit of tension in the interview. Lean into that tension. Lean into that conflict. Don't cower, right? Especially as a journalist working on behalf of the public. These questions need to be asked. The impact needs to be assessed. And some people don't like talking about that. Make them talk about it. Lean into the conflict. It's okay. You're going to be okay. And your interview subject is going to be okay. Sometimes the tension is necessary to get to the solution, to get to the meat of the issue that needs to be solved. When you are in the moment, during your interview, what happens to me oftentimes is that my interview subject will say something so impactful that it doesn't need a follow-up. It doesn't need any more commentary. They have perfectly buttoned up the story. They have perfectly buttoned up the interview. It's okay to end it there. My amazing journalist and reporter friend, Kat Stafford, taught me the term equitable sourcing. What she was getting at when she was teaching me the term is that we need to source for equity. All too often what happens, especially if you are a member of the media, is somebody from the political or corporate elite have the resources and the wherewithal to call a press conference. They have the press contacts to be able to do so. And what happens? We come to said press conference and we digest and take in and re retell the story or the narrative that they wanted told, right? And so, yeah, we're going to go to the mayor's press conference. Yeah, we're going to go to the General Motors press conference if the CEO calls the press conference. But if they are doing work in a city, there are people who will be recipients of this work, good or bad. And all too often, we never talk to the people that this work is supposed to impact. We'll take the mayor's word for it. 
we'll take the GM CEO's word for it without ever talking to impacted communities. And so when Kat talks about equitable sourcing, she's saying don't only take quotes and sources from chambers of power, but go knock on doors in neighborhoods. Go talk to people on the east side. Go talk to people on the west side. Go talk to those workers who may work for that corporation who are making four and five times less than the CEO who, were just, who was just able to call that press conference, right? Are you citing black people, brown people? Are you citing and sourcing women? Are you sourcing experts that look like the communities that they are serving? All too often when we need a, an, an expert source, like an opinion from a medical doctor or uh, a diagnosis from a mental health professional, those kind of specialized professions, those expertises. We find, we find those doctors, we find those professionals, and they don't look like the black people that reside in Detroit, right? Do the work, and it might be extra work to find professional sources that look like the community that you are writing or telling stories for. It means so much to people, especially people like me, to see a representation of themselves, to see themselves reflected on the record. We need to make sure that our relationship with community, with interview subjects, are non-transactional. That means you have to put in the work to build relationships. And relationship building, once again, it takes time. But when you have built a relationship, when you have built that trust, if there's something that you didn't get in an interview and you need to call them back for a follow-up interview or for some follow-up questions, they'll be happy to talk to you because the trust is there, the relationship is there. You're not done dealing with that person once the story is published or once the story is told, right? You have built a mutually beneficial relationship. I would have you know, according to a Pew Research study in 2019, that 7% of newsroom employees are black. 7%. One fifth of black newsroom employees hold leadership positions. That is absolutely asinine. So not only are we just over 7% of the newsroom, but not even half of that are folks who hold leadership positions in the newsrooms. And that piece is important because folks in the C-suite of the newsroom, your editors, your editorial boards, right? Your managing directors are the gatekeepers that get to decide what and how stories are told. There are a little over 100 black owned newspapers in this country. It's not enough. The common barrier that we are facing and fighting is erasure and invisibility. So let's surface and do the work to make visible not only our lives, but our contribution our indelible contribution to the upbuilding and the sustaining of this country. With little over a hundred black newspapers in the country, these kinds of publications, publications that are hyper-local, publications with newsrooms that look like the communities that they cover, they need your help. If this is a public good, the public ought to support said good. Donate to a newsroom that is doing the work right.
support them. Their sustainability and the longevity of that newsroom is contingent upon your support. Black storytellers are all around you. Your local black bookstore, your local black publication, your local griot and historian, right? All of these make up a community of amazing, amazing stories and culture and custom that should be passed down from generation to generation. But the longevity and sustainability of these little shops, these institutions, these historians, these publications are contingent upon your support. If these entities exist for the public good, then the public ought to support. So I admonish you, give what you can. What I think the world can take away from black cultural expression and storytelling is that it is a communal exercise. It directly counters the pressure of capitalism and colonialism. It pushes back against America's tendency for rugged individualism. And it embraces, it embraces and celebrates difference. It celebrates diversity. It celebrates culture. It celebrates community. We are always in need of a village. We are always in need of a community. And so, if the larger world wants to take something from the way we express ourselves and the way we tell our stories, take that. Community. Just a few resources as you endeavor on this journey. Start with your family. Your family has photographs, they got stories, they have obituaries. You ever been to a black funeral? Let me tell you what happens at a black funeral. You go into a black funeral, everybody is searching for and wants a copy of the obituary. It's a staple. And I know people who keep and collect the obituaries because an obituary is a time capsule of somebody's life story, right? Your family has uh, a wide cadre of things that can aid you in this journey. Your local community development organization. This community development organization more than likely is place-based right? It has access to a constituency of long-time residents that need and have the desire to express their story, to express their power. If you are a person that is trying to uncover who you are, where your family comes from, the family story, right? The city's story. There are online newspaper archives at almost all of your local libraries. So go to the library and get to digging. I spend days in the library looking at old newspapers from the Michigan Chronicle, even to the Detroit Free Press. Also, and if you haven't done so already, start your ancestry journey, ancestry.com. The cost is not super prohibitive and you will have access to census records, newspaper archives from around the country, just in case you can't get to the library in Tulsa if you are living in New York, right? And once again, those newspapers also have obituaries for folks who have passed on. Black bookstores are great keepers of our literature, of our custom, and of our culture. One of my favorites is Source Booksellers in the city of Detroit in Midtown. Go see Miss Janice and Miss Allison. Tell them Orlando said hi. And another one of my favorites is in Philly. Uncle Bobby's Bookstore, owned by scholar Mark Lamont Hill. It's a coffee shop and it's a bookstore. Also, Community Book Center in New Orleans, Louisiana. Go see Miss Vera at Community Book Center. For the journalists out there, or for the people who want to be journalists, 
There is an online academy that is free to you. NBCU Online Journalism Academy. Log on to the website. It is filled with resources that will help you conduct interviews, editing, uh, research, and sourcing. It's a great resource. Hey, if you want to write the news, if you want to write the stories, be sure to pick you up uh, the Associated Press Style Guide. Yes. It is an entirely different kind of writing when you are writing for news, when you are writing the news. We go by AP style. So it's a different system. It takes a while to learn. But once you get the hang of it, you'll be great. This by far is a question that I often ask myself. How are you going to take care of yourself in this work? And the answer is this. Do not betray yourself, your care, and your well-being for this work. Do not allow yourself to become a martyr for this work. Listen to your spirit. Listen to your soul. Listen to your body and step away when you need to. If you are a storyteller of color and you live amongst people of color, more times than not, you will operate in this duality of being the storyteller while also experiencing the infliction of trauma that policy and institutions often inflict on communities of color. And you'll find yourself tasked with having to find words. But if you can't find the words in that moment, that's okay. Step away and go and care for yourself. Somebody else, because you've built that village, can step in. More importantly, ask yourself, who's a part of your network? Who's a part of your village? This work is heavy, it is daunting, it is joyful, but it is not work that you should do alone. Build your village. Get you a producer. Get you an audio person. Get you um, a thought partner where you can run ideas by. A soundboard, if you will. Build your village. One of my favorite people in the world, Todd Nasi Quote, said in his book, Between the World and Me, I would not have you to descend into your own dream, I would have you be a conscious citizen of this terrible and beautiful world. It's beautiful. It is terrible. Both of those things weigh the same, y'all. But don't descend into yourself. Be conscious. Be a citizen. Be a neighbor. My final encouragement to you is to move and act with a sense of urgency. The work of the griot, the West African storyteller, the passer down of story, custom, and culture is urgent. It's now in a world where we are fighting mass amnesia, where we are up against communal, Erasure, it is urgent that you take part in the literary resistance, in the audio resistance, in the research resistance, in the video resistance. Make it impossible for us to be erased. I believe in you, so come on. Join our village. We can do it together.